When we think about time travel, our minds often drift to the realm of science fiction, conjuring images of DeLoreans and flux capacitors, much like what we see in Back to the Future. It's fun to think about, right? But deep down, we've all been conditioned to think that time travel is a mere fantasy, an idea confined to the imaginative spaces of Hollywood. It's something we often brush off as impossible. But what if I told you that someone out there might have cracked the code, not a genius with boundless resources like Elon Musk, but just an average guy without even a science degree? You would call me crazy, right? Well, that's where I introduce Mike Markham, an amateur inventor who liked to tinker with various electronics from Stanbury, Missouri. He lacked formal science training, but he had a natural talent for electronics ever since a kid. The back porch of his house looked like an old storage unit that consisted of old TVs, radios, and CD players that were all dismantled, with their insides spilled everywhere. There were spools of copper wire and magnets of all sizes. His current project was the Jacob's Ladder, a device that consisted of two metal rods which start close together at the bottom and spread apart as they go up. Assuming most of you don't know what a Jacob's Ladder is, it's a relatively simple device. The big box on the bottom is called a transformer. A transformer is something that changes the voltage going to a device. You probably have several transformers in your home. For example, the charger on your cell phone is a transformer. Your cell phone converts the 120 volts that come out of the wall into 9 or 12 volts. The Jacob's Ladder converts the same 120 volts to more than 500 volts. When the Jacob's Ladder is turned on, electrons are fed into one of the wires. These electrons want to get away from each other, so they jump across to the other wire which is connected to the ground. When they jump, we see a bright spark in the air. The spark then climbs up the ladder as it heats the air around it. But Mike had an idea for a modified version of a Jacob's Ladder. The first thing he had to do was create a transformer. To get the arc of electricity going in a Jacob's Ladder, you need a high voltage power supply that packs over 10,000 volts. See now the problem is that in the United States, the standard household voltage is 120 or 240 volts. So clearly that wasn't going to work, so Mike decided to build his own transformer. Basically what you do is wrap two separate coils of wire around the power source. One coil is connected to the power source, which would be the fuse box of Mike's house. The other coil then has fewer turns to step down the voltage if needed. Mike actually turned the wire until he reached over 400 turns, which he then lost count of, but he coiled enough wire to step up his voltage from 120 volts to over 20,000 volts. Now that he's got his power supply, he needs climbing rods or conductors, and Mike actually used wire hangers for this. How it works is the voltage is turned on and fed to the conductors. The electrical pressure then ionizes the air particles between the rods, allowing a current to flow. The arc starts at the narrowest point where the rods are closest together, and then the heat from the arc makes the air around it hotter and less dense. Hot ionized air has lower resistance, hot air rises, and so the electrical arc rises along the conductors, but the arc won't start on its own. You need to initiate it manually by moving the rods closer together or farther apart. It's extremely delicate, and even the slightest change can turn it off. For example, if the air pressure changes, it won't work. If humidity changes, it won't work. This gave Mike an idea. What if he used lasers to heat the air around the conductors? This would lower the air resistance and make the spark ignite without him having to do it. The most common household item that has any type of lasers in it is CD players. By removing the laser emitters from the CD players, it allowed Mike to continue his construction. Mike plugged in his transformer and fired it up, but there was no spark. It didn't work. His blueprint failed. As he went to go disconnect the machine, Mike saw a circle of wavy air above the device. It most likely resembled what you'd see when looking at hot air, meaning it was hardly visible. Unsure if he just made a portal, or if it was just hot air from the electricity, Mike threw a metal screw into the energy field. The screw disappeared, almost like it was completely vaporized. Mike just stood there for a second, confused. He didn't know if the screw got vaporized or if it really did go into the future. As he was thinking, the screw then fell out of the circle and landed on the ground a couple of feet away. Mike is still confused. I mean, who wouldn't? Mike continued to repeat this experiment a few times with the screw, and every time the same result happened. He tossed the object in, it disappeared for a second or so, then reappeared out of the circle. Now Mike didn't know if his machine was teleporting objects or possibly sending them a few seconds into the future. After a few more tests, the machine overloaded with electricity and fried every piece of the electronics. Mike realizing that he may be onto something 
had to come up with an idea to remake his invention, but this time, instead of it being 18 inches tall, he needed to build it 8 feet tall. And to do that, he needed a lot more power, and Mike knew exactly where to get it. Mike believes he might have just invented a time machine, but he's not quite sure yet. Mike has a plan that will test the limits of his newly founded invention, but step one in creating this blueprint, Mike needs a better power source. A way better power source. We are talking about transformers that are capable of handling 50,000 volts or more without even getting close to overloading. What he really needed was the kind of transformers found on power poles. However, these transformers weren't cheap, and Mike wasn't necessarily the richest guy. Mike knowing he was on the verge of discovery led him to come up with a plan. Mike planned to get the help of his friends with pickup trucks and drive to the King City, Missouri Power Company and pick up six industrial grade transformers that Mike knew were not going to be used. A few weeks later, he had his new version of the machine. The transformers were connected to Mike's power box, new lasers were in place, and the wire hanger conductors were upgraded to four foot long, one inch metal rods. With this new improved machine, only one thing was left to do. Turning on the machine, there was a loud crack, a spark, and then nothing. His whole house went dark. The new machine knocked out the power. In fact, Mike knocked out the power in the whole town. After hours of tinkering, Mike was soon able to get the machine running without causing brownouts all over town. And the machine actually worked. It created the same energy field from before, but this time it was a few feet wide. Mike, knowing he just replicated what he's done before, started to send objects through the vortex, but this time objects weren't reappearing a few seconds later, they weren't reappearing at all. The objects were just vanishing and not appearing anywhere. Mike, while testing his machine, heard a pounding on the front door. Mike opened the door, and there were eight deputies on the property. The officer at the door had a search warrant. Mike's neighbors had reported a lot of weird activity happening at the house, and it didn't take long for the police to put together Mike's project and a report from the power company of a lot of missing equipment. So Mike Markham would have to put a hold on what he was planning because now he's going to jail. Mike Markham got 60 days in jail and five years probation for stealing the transformers and stealing power. Yeah, it turns out he wasn't using his own power source for the machine. After jail, Mike still wanted to pursue his idea of this time machine, but since he was jailed, he lost his house, he lost his job, and he was a menace in his town because of the blackouts. But lucky enough, something happened. His story made the news. The headline was, Kansas City Man Tries to Build a Time Machine on Porch. That headline caught the interest of someone who was widely known. That someone was Art Bell. You know me, and these kinds of stories and how I'm fascinated by time. So, I set out to find young Mr. Markham, and I found him. Mike's interview with Art Bell was surprising. Most believed that Mike was just crazy and had no clue what he was talking about. But the thing was that Art Bell knew a lot about this topic. Uh, like, that's where they got started at. Okay, well, there are ways to do that. The Van de Graaff generator, for example. You familiar with that? Uh, yeah. Millions of people listened to that interview that night, and surprisingly, people loved Mike's idea. Mike came across as genuine and sounded like he actually knew what he was talking about. Loving Mike's idea, people were calling in with offers. Some had transformers they would donate, others had property he could use, and plenty of people were ready to financially support Mike in building a new, bigger machine. Okay, you might be asking yourself, what made people so convinced of Mike's theory? Well, funny enough, Mike's arresting officer reported that in Mike's house, Mike had built an electric lighter out of parts of an old microwave, an electronic piggy bank that would count money as it was put in it, and much more. This made the arresting officer convinced that Mike actually knew what he was talking about. This not only skyrocketed his credibility, but also convinced physicists to talk to Mike. A few of these physicists talked about his technology and how it could be used for time travel. Several scientists helped Mike come up with an idea for a mechanism with rotating magnets that would make the machine easier to control. So, with the new funding, Mike got a warehouse, all the equipment he needed, and access to more power than he could ever use. It took about a year, but he finally built a newer, larger, and highly upgraded version of his time machine, and it actually worked. Mike 
After about 18 years of disappearing, Mike finally came back on the Art Bell Show. Mike, welcome to Midnight in the Desert. Yeah, it's been a, been a long time, Art. <laughs> <laughs> been a long time. 18, 20 years ago, right? The first interview, and then 18 years ago? A lot had happened since the last time he and Art spoke, and because of Mike's Patreon, he had money, equipment, and lots of power. Mike set up in a warehouse in Overland Park, Kansas. There he built several iterations of his time machine. The most successful version used rotating magnets, so instead of having a small energy field, Mike was able to create what he called a plasma tornado. Use the magnetic field to do what? Um, basically, it's, uh, well, in simple terms, this thing looks like a, basically a plasma tornado. Mike says he created a plasma tornado, so how is that even possible? Well, Mike's first machine ran at 20,000 volts. The next version used about 70,000 volts. This new machine, which is about 15 feet tall, was pulling around 3 million volts. If you're not aware, amps are the amount of power. Voltage is the pressure of the power, so even if you don't have a lot of amps, you can still create really high voltage. Almost like you're stretching it out, you're building up its pressure. So in this case, voltage, that's basically what a transformer does. This is how the Philadelphia experiment was done. I briefly touched on that topic in my Antarctica video. If you haven't already, I recommend watching it. But in short, the Philadelphia experiment was done with high voltage and rotating magnetic fields. Several scientists said that if building a time machine was possible, Mike's technology was on the right track because it's actually supported by Einstein's equations and they supported the idea of time travel. There are many blueprints of different kinds of time travel designs that are compatible with Einstein's theory. For example, gigantic spinning cylinders. You go around the cylinder and you come back before you left. Mike started testing this machine by throwing small objects through the vortex. Just like before, they just disappeared. But the thing was, they weren't disappearing. They would just end up in different locations. The objects would enter the vortex, disappear for a few minutes, and reappear up to 150 yards away, going east or west of the machine, but never north or south. Mike believed that this was due to the Earth's rotation or magnetic field. I know this sounds obviously fake, but the thing was that there was 15 witnesses watching these tests happen. These people were Patreons supporting Mike's invention. The tests worked so well that they decided to move on from objects and try it on small animals, more specifically small guinea pigs, mice, and hamsters. Mike ran these tests over 200 times. Mike tinkered with the machine, coming to the conclusion that if he upped the voltage or sped up the magnets, he could control how far things would travel. Leading up to this point, Mike was able to perfect almost everything, and this led to one final test to try, himself. Mike, standing in front of the vortex, prepared himself and walked through. After a flash of bright lights, Mike was gone. Mike Markham woke up in the middle of a field with a splitting headache, not remembering how he got there, or even his own name. After walking on a path for a couple of minutes, Mike's memory started to come back. Mike eventually made it to Fairfield, Ohio, just outside of Cincinnati. Mike was 800 miles away from the warehouse in Kansas City. Mike, when he woke up, had no wallet, meaning no driver's license or money. Mike made it to a homeless shelter, where he saw a newspaper two years in the future. Mike was eventually able to scrounge up enough cash to get a bus back to the warehouse in Kansas City. When returning to the warehouse, Mike was met with emptiness. Everything he owned in the warehouse was gone, the machine was gone, and all of Mike's documents were gone. Where did it all go? Well, no one knows. Even through this major setback, Mike was convinced he could remake the machine just like before, but he needed more money. Mike appeared on Art Bell's show now for the third time, catching him up on what happened. Even though it's been two years, listeners were ready to fund his project again. And uh, I'm actually looking at the, the I, this one guy suggests uh, I'm actually looking at the website now. Go uh, go to tell him to set up a GoFundMe account. <laughs> yeah, yeah, GoFundMe or uh, uh, you know, well that's crowdfunding, right? Yeah. Mike now with the new machine continued to test just like before. Mike was able to get back to the point where he could test on himself again. The problem was that he couldn't bring metal through the vortex, it would either explode or teleport randomly. 
Mike, after some more testing, found out that if he constructed a metal tube a certain way, he could put metal into the tube and transport it through the vortex. That was the last time anyone has heard from Mike. Art Bell, who covered the story the entire time, heard nothing, until one night on his show, a caller showed Art a news article about a man who had drowned in 1930 that washed up on shore in along with a metal tube with a small rectangular device that no one knew what it was at the time. He had no ID on him, so he was identified as John Doe. This article led many people to believe that John Doe was Mike Markham. The story of Mike Markham is very interesting. It's one of the best time travel stories we have today. But is any of this true? Well, although it's a great story, many things are made up to add dramatic effect to the story. Even in the third interview with Art Bell, Mike clears up a lot of false information, including the article from 1930. In reality, Mike Markham isn't dead. He's still alive. But what about the time machine? There are still those witnesses who claim to have seen it, but just speaking realistically here, it's probably false. Although it is worth noting that scientists do believe that if time travel existed, Mike's invention would be how it's done. I mean, anything's possible here. Even Einstein's theory of gravity supports time travel. The heavier the gravity, the faster time moves. So theoretically, if Mike was able to make a high gravity vortex, it's possible. Time travel is always a topic that's fun to think about, but with no actual proof, it's hard to say Mike's story is true. Huge shout out to those who made this video possible. Thank you to the Unknown Archive on YouTube for providing the Art Bell interviews. And big thanks to the Y Files on YouTube for this idea. This video was heavily inspired by them. They make great content over on their page and I really encourage you guys to check it out. And again, I know I say this almost every video now, but seriously I want to thank you guys for the amount of support you have shown me recently. I can't believe that we already hit 1000 subscribers, so seriously thank you. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please comment on what you think about Mike Markham and if you believe the story is realistic or not. Stay safe everyone and thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.